Let's understand together the principles of managing a patient of a posterior polar cataract under a topical anesthesia. Let's move to watching the surgery. This is the patient with a classic posterior polar cataract. Now after instilling a few drops of paracaine prior to this step, we start with making the incisions. as well as while creating both the paracentesis incisions. We must always have counter pressure while making these incisions. Note how the cotton bud held at the opposite point gives me the counter pressure in my case. We then inject some intraocular xylocaine to give some intraocular anesthesia. Resurfacing the cornea intermittently with viscoelastic helps in preventing the corneal epithelium from drying. This is followed by the introduction of a few drops of blue dye under air to stain the anterior capsule which is then subsequently washed out. We then proceed with the gentle introduction of an OBD into the anterior chamber whilst displacing the air bubble out of the eye. All our movements during a phaco emulsification of a polar cataract need to be gentle. We then proceed with making the capsular excess. I like to do it with a good amount of stereocoaxial illumination as you can see here because it enhances my visibility. I also like to create a capsular excess no more than 5 mm in size. I ensure at this point that the patient doesn't make any jerky movements by instructing him to keep his eyes absolutely steady. As you can see, we have now completed the capsular excess. We now proceed to performing the hydrodelineation. After gently removing a little viscoelastic from the anterior chamber, the hydrodissection cannula is introduced and buried into the nucleus to a certain depth. The depth to which it is introduced prior to the injection of the BSS, as you will see, results in defining the size of the resultant endonucleus. So you need to know how deep to go and where to stop prior to injecting the fluid for hydrodelineation. The end result of a well-performed hydrodelineation is one, You've created the endonucleus that needs to be emulsified. Two, you've got yourself an epinuclear shell that actually protects the posterior capsule during the endonuclear emulsification. Next, we proceed to the nucleus management. As you can see, this is a very soft cataract. Now, with respect to the FACO settings, I'm going to work with a very low power, no more than 20%. As you can see, when I start to hold on to the endonucleus, just in aspiration alone, I'm able to elevate and aspirate it. And having completed the endonucleus emulsification, I now remove the second instrument and perform a viscofluid exchange. Now, performing a viscofluid exchange is one of the most important steps while doing a polar cataract phaco emulsification because this prevents any shallowing of the anterior chamber when the source of irrigation comes out of the eye. Shallowing of the anterior chamber could get the posterior capsule to rise and could result in a PC rupture. Next, we performed a viscodissection of the epinucleus. This enables us to loosen out the epinucleus from its equatorial part, get it to prolapse out towards the center, thereby facilitating its easier removal. Because the capsular bag is empty, there's no nucleus there, I find that this step does not increase the pressure within the capsular bag and doesn't have an added risk of compromising the posterior capsule. Next, you will see how we use the bimanual irrigation aspiration to remove this epinuclear shell. Note how I hold on to the epinucleus more towards the periphery and draw it out towards the center. I always ensure, however, that I do not cross over to the opposite side. I tend to loosen it from all four sides, bringing the loose parts into the center prior to their subsequent aspiration and removal. Now remember that this case has been performed under a topical anesthesia. As long as your instruments are in the eye, that is either phaco probe in a second instrument or the bimanual irrigation aspiration cannulas, we have complete control on the achinacea. Now that we are speaking about the topical phaco going on here, it's important to be mindful that sometimes some squeezing movements of the eye can cause a resultant upthrust of the posterior capsule. We now watch the removal of this epinucleus. Absence of the step of hydrodissection may make the removal of this peripheral cortex sometimes challenging. 
Note how the epineuclis is being released on all sides and is drawn out to the center. I once more perform a viscal fluid exchange to ensure that I do not let the anterior chamber shallow and the posterior capsule rise. Let's now watch the completion of the removal of this epineuclis. Having separated the entire epineucleus from the periphery, I now perform a viscofluid exchange prior to removal of the irrigation from the eye. We now proceed to the aspiration of the epineucleus. Now this step can also pose a challenge because if there is any underlying adhesion, removal of the sheet can result in a sudden opening out of the posterior capsule. In this case though, however, after removal of the epineucleus, I can see an intact posterior capsule underlying it. I then proceed to removing the rest of the cortex. Once more, I perform a viscofluid exchange prior to swapping my hands for completing the bimanual irrigation aspiration. Please note that despite the presence of some cells stuck to the posterior capsule, I have avoided the step of PC polish. It should be avoided in cases of a posterior polar cataract, as it could result in a disruption of the posterior capsule. Under viscoelastic cover, I now introduce the single piece monofocal IOL with care and caution gently into the capsular bag. Any manipulations of the IOL within the capsular bag should happen always under a viscoelastic cover. And this is because in a patient undergoing a topical phaco emulsification, there's always the tendency of an upthrust of the posterior capsule. We now come to the penultimate step that is washing out of the visco. A gentle movement of the IOL would result in removal of all the viscoelastic, including that trapped from behind the IOL. In cases like this, I would refrain from going behind the IOL either with the irrigation or aspiration to wash out the visco. After removal of the viscoelastic, we now come to the last step that is stromal hydration. The stromal hydration should also be performed reasonably gently. Excessive pressure whilst performing stromal hydration itself can result in a disruption of the posterior capsule. A meticulously performed phaco emulsification in a patient with a posterior polar cataract, even when performed under topical anesthesia, can result with reproducibly optimal outcomes. I hope you enjoyed this video presentation. Thank you.